cellular transposition events from plasmids to other replicants. Oh, so, no, yes, no. The title is to be announced. So he will announce himself the title. Sorry about this. No problem. Let me share. So I will present very briefly a model on the evolution of plasmid size. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the wonderful place uh, where the conference should have been. Too bad that uh, it didn't work out, but still, this is a wonderful place. So the, the model that I will briefly present is about the evolution of plasmid content and especially plasmid length in terms of number of genes, or if you want, or total length of the genome. Uh, of course, uh, plasmids have very dynamical gene content, uh, and uh, it's quite natural to expect that there will be many different phenomena acting depending on the type of plasmid and so on. So here I will oversimplify things a lot. Uh, and most of my reasoning won't apply to most of the plasmids, most, most likely. But uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that there are too many forces that, uh, that will dominate, uh, in any case, uh, the, 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 the dynamic of the, of the plasmidome. So one is the mutation, gene loss and acquisition, and one is, is the selective forces acting on the genes, uh, on the specific gene content, and how that determines fitness. Now, if we look at the mutational pressure, there are several cases that we can consider. The symmetric case where gain and loss, and loss or insertion deletion pressures are the same is, pro is, is probably unlikely. The, the case of, uh, of uh, a, a deletion bias or a loss bias is possible. So a situation where plasmids would tend to lose genes over time and would tend to shrink. However, it's unlikely to imply that in, long, in the long term, plasmid would be, would be stable. It's not impossible. You can have selective forces that are strong enough, but it's some way a, a, a weird scenario. The other scenario is, the, is to have uh, um, insertion bias or gain bias in the sense that plasmids tend to grow with time. Uh, in at least mutationally, in terms of acquiring more and more genes. This is a case where we can have, for example, mutation selection bias in this context, and we can have a sort of stable plasmid population. Then there could be more complicated size-dependent biases. So for example, having a sort of constant insertion pressure, so a constant rate of acquisition of genes independently of the size of the plasmid, but an increasing the pressure for deletion. The, this, the, this may be an interesting scenario. Uh, we, it's, it's quite complicated to assess uh, really what's the, what's, the, what's the trends towards acquisition or loss of genes at different lengths. I will focus uh, to, to get some understanding on how plasmids may evolve on the, on the case of insertion bias. And I will focus on another simplification of that case to get just to get a model that, that, that gets the glimpse of the fundamental phenomena here. So the case where there is a very strong bias towards gene gain, so a very strong insertion pressure, essentially neglecting, uh, uh, neglecting gene loss. Of course, gene loss will be there. We simply assume that uh, it's, it's essentially not comparable to the rate of gene acquisition. And uh, of course, there will, be, there will be selection of gene content both in terms of fitness gains by, by, by acquiring more genes and in terms of fitness costs. This is a situation where we have uh, essentially mutation and selection acting in different directions. And this is a classic of evolutionary biology. In most of evolutionary biology, what we see in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, diversity is determined uh, by a balance between the entropic pressure, the mutational pressure that generates entropy and selective pressures. That, uh, that keep it at bay. And this is, this is another, kind, another of these kind of models where we can uh, assess in a very simple way what may be the fitness of these plasmids. So we assume uh, simplifying a lot uh, that uh, essentially we have a, fit, a fixed fit, fitness advantage for a gene. Of course, we will have fluctuating selection. We will have environmental dependence on these advantages. But we assume that overall, across all different environments that a plasmid could find itself, they will have a fitness advantage S per gene. We also assume that there will be a redundancy in gene content, so that acquiring new genes doesn't necessarily mean acquiring new actual, actual functions. Genes could be simply copied or copies of each other, or genes could, could anyway cover uh, 
more or less the same function in such a way that they are redundant. And, and therefore, there's a diminishing return in the acquisition of more and more genes. And we model it with the classical coupon collector approach, so exponential saturation in fitness. We assume a constant fitness cost per gene. Uh, and we can add some more complication for, for the advantage in terms of uh, um, conjugation rate and the cost of the conjugation machine or, or mobility related genes and so on. So the fitness has the shape that you can see here in terms of the length of, or the size of the plasmid. The case that is most interesting is the first one where essentially there is some gain for the plasmid to grow a little bit, at least when it's small. But then you see that the cost of additional genes and the, and, and the diminishing return brings the, the fitness down. Now, this simple model, we, one could write the, the, the equation solving them with the method of characteristics and so on. But I, I go towards the main, uh, the main intuitions from the model because they are actually the, the thing that is really in, the important. So the first thing is that uh, if we compare what is the most likely plasmid size in this model versus what is the size that would maximize the fitness of the plasmid, we find a mismatch. The, fitness of the, uh, the size that maximizes the fitness of the plasmid with increasing selection, of course, both of them increase, but the peak is always quite far. So, so the, the most likely plasmid length is, is quite, quite uh, longer than the fitness peak. So we have a sort of insertion burden of insertion load in the sense that this mutational pressure to, uh, to acquire genes is essentially causing the plasmid to contain more genes that would be needed. And selection is try actively trying to get rid essentially of these plasmids that have an excessive insertion load. And curiously enough, this insertion load in this model implies that plasmids are marginally persistent. So, the fitness peak, as you see, is here, but the most likely length is precisely when the fitness of the plasmid is around zero. Because essentially, under stronger insertion pressure, under strong pressure for acquisition of new genes, the point at which it's quite likely to find the plasmids is at the end of its acquisition process when the selective pressure is really strong against it and the fitness is precisely zero. So, in this model, a bit paradoxically, plasmids find themselves on the border of, uh, of evolution and stability. Of course, uh, it, one can include the machinery uh, in uh, so the communication machinery in, uh, in this model. And the idea is that uh, the more effective is the communication machinery in terms of the, of the effectiveness of communication versus the cost of the machinery, the more the plasmid can carry uh, more mobility, no, more non mobility related genes. So we expect the genes that, that sorry, the plasmid that, that, that have a, a more effective machinery will also carry more genes on average, more accessory genes on the, on, and therefore uh, they will be longer. Now, one can ask in this model what happens when we increase environmental stress. So, for example, antimicrobial, antimicrobial concentration. If this increase is gradual, what happens is simply the size of the plasmids increases gradually, because essentially these plasmids tend to acquire gradually genes that, that, that are antimicrobial resistance or, resistance or stress resistant genes. Mm -hmm. However, if they, this, uh, this increase is, 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 is very rapid, what happens is that there is a mismatch between what would be the evolution equilibrium and uh, the state uh, where the plasmids find itself. Uh, so the insertion load is lower than what would one would expect for that plasmid. And essentially the plasmid has a transient stress induced fitness boost. So that if I suddenly increase the, the environmental stress, paradoxically, I find that plasmids tend to be at higher fitness, at, at, at relative fitness in, uh, in the environment and therefore tend to spread more widely. Now, this model is oversimplified. There are several more realistic extensions one of the obvious ones is include uh, uh, gene loss, uh, at least uh, some components of gene loss uh, and different, uh, different constituents of the genome. So different parts with different functions and so on. We have, in, we have done, done some of that. For example, here there's a two, a two component model with two different sets of genes that can have different uh, fitness and fitness, and fitness cost. More in general, these models are of course oversimplified, but they offer some glimpse 
about some interesting phenomena that may happen in, uh, in, in, uh, in aptoid plasmids and may help explaining them. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luca. Uh, maybe you, we have a, one question from Simon Pompey. Ciao, Luca. Uh, I have a question here. So which units are you using in your definition of the fitness? It's like per generation, because this S is the selection coefficient. It looked quite big, it was about one or two. So I, I, was, I was using an habitat unit, so I was not specifying the time scale over which that happens. I mean, you can't- okay, so it's not per generation in general. No, no, no. I, okay. I mean, you, you, can, you can play a lot with the model. What, what is general are the consequences that I listed that don't, don't really depend on the parameters. So the, fit, the, the, the most likely length is always the length at which you get zero fitness, no matter what is your absolute scale and so on. Thank you. Nothing else? Okay, so uh, thank you, Luca. We have now um, the talk by Adam Roberts. Uh, he couldn't be here today because of uh, important personal reasons. And he will, we will try to uh, uh, have him somewhere in the next days. So now we have Time, a short time for a break, Alice? Or you want a general discussion?